I was a bit uh, lost. Uh, and what do I mean by lost? When I first decided to come here, I wanted to speak about uh, energy. And Federico invited me, and uh, I told Federico, uh, wherever I am, anywhere in the world, I'm going to be there. Okay, it does not matter. If Federico asks, I'm going to be there. So, so I was thinking about what I should talk about. And um, my specialty, of course, is energy and Middle Eastern affairs. And uh, my exact specialty is energy in the Middle East, and in particular, the Gulf region. So I thought I'd speak about that. I thought that might be enlightening and relevant for uh, the audience. But then at the same time, after seeing many of the interesting presentations that you guys have given about uh, your nonprofit work, NGOs, elections, and so on and so forth, filmmaking, I, I thought that um, maybe I should make it relevant for your everyday lives. And uh, I thought that perhaps it might be a little bit more abstract if I were to speak about energy in the Gulf. Uh, so I was thinking perhaps I should just substitute my current presentation for talk about my nonprofit. So I kind of wear two hats. Uh, one hat, I, I guess you can call it the dark side. I, I work with uh, oil and gas issues in the Gulf. Then I guess the light side, I do nonprofit work in developing countries and I spread renewable energy. I, in particular, our, uh, one of our major projects is in Haiti. So I just give a few minutes about my Haitian project and uh, I'd be very interested if uh, anyone is interested in collaboration or in uh, sharing best practices uh, because I feel that we've found some very unique um, or we've had some very unique conclusions about uh, how best to attack the issue of energy poverty, particularly in developing nations. Uh, my colleague and I, we started our nonprofit. Its former name was Intertel, but we engaged in a systematic and thorough rebranding effort about several months ago because we received some criticism about the name. Uh, when we first came up with the name, it was supposed to be some idealistic and long name, the Interna International Institute of Ideas. But <laughs> the short name was Intertel, but uh, some of our donors said, we're not going to give you another dollar unless you change your name. <laughs> and we literally, we literally had gotten some um, negative feedback from some of our donors. I mean, it was positive, but I mean, it was also, <laughs> right. they weren't happy. Uh, they said that, okay, what is Intertel? What does that stand for? Some people thought it was a venture, or I thought it was a startup company, a computer startup company. Uh, some thought it was a CIA front organization, you know, wow. spreading subversion in the developing countries, I guess. And we, I really got that. Uh, so we engage in rebranding. Our new name now is EarthSpark International, but if you go to our website, you'll see it's Intertel. So, Intertel? Intertel. Inter right, Intertel, both with two eyes. You know, Intertel. Uh, so we started our initial project in Haiti, and as Jamiko, without prior uh, talk or discussion about this, she, she mentioned this during her, during her talk, and I just found this out, but Intertel uses a very unique strategy in order to uh, coordinate with the local population uh, because we feel that only the local population knows what is best for itself. So we act as facilitators, okay? And we have many people in our organization that have different skill sets, but they're extremely good at what they do. So when we go down to Haiti, uh, we sit with the population and we try to discover what it is the population wants and what it is they feel is the most pertinent and the most relevant issue that they face in their daily lives. So after we discover what the main issue is, then we sit down, my co-founder and I, and then we develop a plan of action. And then we take uh, just uh, enormous streams of data. We, we, we have questionnaires, surveys, and so on. We're extremely data-driven. We integrate that information into our action plan. And then when we integrate this information into our action plan, then we develop a strategy on how best to attack this uh, particular problem. And then we sit down with the local community and we see if this is, are they happy with it? and whether it works for them. Uh, and we feel that this is a very participatory approach. And, and that's one of our um, foundations, is participation. And uh, I, you know, and this word has received a lot of flack today, but empowerment, you know, we truly mean that because we don't want to be in Haiti forever. We actually have an exit plan uh, for uh, three years. Uh, there's going to be no surge. <laughs> so after three years, we steadily scale down and then we want to just leave Haiti, and we hope they send us an email after we have uh, founded the initial uh, organizations and partnerships and some of the energy stores that we've started and that it would just continue on without us. So again, that's it in a nutshell, and if anyone's interested in collaboration and just finding out more about what we do or in just talking or whatnot, uh, just please let me know. You can grab me or email me or whatever. My, my door is open. Now, I like to talk about uh, the golf now. How many of you have been to the Arabian Gulf? Or actually, there's a bit of dispute. Uh, some people call it the Persian Gulf, but uh, that term's up for grabs. But how many people here have traveled to the Gulf before? 
just want to find out whether people have any type of. Uh, the Gulf, I would say the Arabian Peninsula. So meaning Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, Oman, or Yemen. Okay, two people have, excellent, okay. Now, what are your ideas, three people, okay. What are your ideas about, uh, let's say, energy in the Gulf? I mean, can people give me some answers? I mean, natural gas, oil, I, people have any general ideas about it? Or any strongly held, passionate opinions? The cup runneth over. I, I'm sorry? So the cup runneth over. Oh, okay, that's, that's definitely one, I'm gonna cover that. Um, the focus is all on oil, but they got a lot of sun. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yes. Uh, anything else? Robes. Yes. I'm sorry? Robes. Robes, yes, <laughs> robes is a very important issue. Yes. A big dispute over Saudi energy reserves? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. That is a very important issue, yes. Uh, anything else? Yes? Big variation, how efficient it's extracted. I'm sorry? Big variation, how efficient it's extracted. Yes, yes, that's true. You're talking about the oil, correct? Yes, that's true. Although they are getting better at that you know, due to a technology transfer. Uh, now these are, I'm sorry? Uh, a lot of the energy is government run or government control. Yes, yes. Actually the oil sector in the Gulf is owned by the government. Uh, they consider it to be a strategic sector and they allow, not in the oil sector, but uh, in the natural gas sector, they allow limited participation with foreign firms, uh, predominantly Western firms. But this tends to be more of an aspect of um, they don't have the relevant technology or necessary technology to exploit their natural gas reserves. But in terms of oil, it's completely owned by the government. Okay, and this is also, this is one aspect of the decolonization drive that occurred in the 60s and 70s. And OPEC was a direct outgrowth out of the decolonization drive and the push for the countries that were either colonized or in the developing world to exert strategic control over their natural resources. So, uh, what I'm gonna speak about today is, and it will touch on most of the issues that you brought up is natural gas in the Gulf, okay? And uh, I'm going to speak about the energy crisis in the Gulf. So these are the main discussion points. I'm going to speak about um, the GCC energy sector, okay? Now what's the GCC? The GCC stands for the Gulf Cooperation Council, which you can say it's almost akin to the EU, but the EU for the Gulf. It's comprised of the six nations, or six nations of the Arabian Gulf, but minus Yemen. So Yemen's not in it, but we have Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar and uh, the United Arab Emirates and Oman as well. So that's the GCC. So I'm going to use the GCC and the Gulf interchangeably during my lecture. I'm going to speak about the GCC energy crisis, which sounds counterintuitive, uh, you know, but actually the, there is a quite, um, quite a problem that's occurring right now and I saw it with my own eyes when I was in Kuwait. I'm going to give a sustained analysis of the crisis. I'm going to look at the positive solutions and how this crisis can be resolved and I'm going to give some future outlooks. And uh, there are several things that are happening, dynamic things uh, that are occurring in the finance sector and uh, in the banking sector in the Gulf, which is tied in with the energy sector as well. And these things are just occurring because of the in, uh, financial crisis, the global financial crisis. So to give an overview of the GCC energy sector, in terms of oil, uh, the GCC is home to nearly 45% of the world's proven oil reserves. So it produces about 15 million barrels per day for the international market, but due to the recent drop in oil price, which occurred after the summer of 2008, uh, OPEC has made substantial production costs in order to uh, shore up the price, the price floor. And the cuts equaled approximately 4 million barrels per day. And altogether, there's about a billion, I, I'm sorry, there's about 1 trillion barrels of proven oil reserves altogether. So these figures are obviously quite uh, intimidating. In terms of natural gas, the GCC accounts for nearly 25% of the world's uh, gas reserves. Now gas is becoming increasingly important in the world market. So we're going to start to see an increased focus on how countries deal with energy, energy security and also natural gas. And uh, so far that hasn't really been an issue, but with, um, as more developed countries start to use, um, let's say, natural gas in power generation and so on, gas is going to start to take on as much importance as oil took on previously, let's say during 1970s. Uh, now, due to the GCC share of world gas consumption, uh, gas consumption is rising rapidly within the Gulf, so that means that more of the Gulf's gas is gonna be redirected to the domestic market. Okay, so it's not gonna be exported. And the reason that's happening is due to several reasons, but the two most important is uh, due to demographic revolution that's occurring. Uh, you have a lot of expatriates that are coming to work in the industries, both in menial tasks and also 
more high level jobs. And then you also have uh, the birth rate is increasing as well, so the local population is increasing. And then you also have uh, major industrialization that's occurring uh, in the heavy industry uh, in the Gulf. Because basically there's this strategic goal is to take the Gulf, the Gulf countries, their individual countries, and to place it on par with the developed countries. So they no longer want to be dependent on demand from the Western world. And they themselves want to export advanced technology to the West. That's their uh, new goal. And there's also a focus on renewable technology. And uh, I think someone mentioned that earlier about the sun. Uh, there is a focus on trying to develop concentrated solar power, uh, predominantly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's also uh, trying to produce renewable energy technology and become an exporter of renewable energy technology to the West. And that's in uh, the UAE. Uh, there has been uh, about 15 to $20 billion that has been placed into research in the UAE on renewable energy technology and, and trying to ship that technology to the EU and to uh, the US. And there's also carbon capture and storage. And I'm not certain if most people are familiar with this, but carbon capture and storage is big oil's response to climate change. Okay, and basically what that means is you take uh, an emission point for carbon and what you do is you basically just capture it before it's, um, before it's emitted into the atmosphere. And then what they do is they pump it deep within the ground. So that means you can still, if it works successfully, that means you can still use fossil fuels, but basically you just put it beneath the ground so it th is not released uh, in the atmosphere. So that is a way that many of the oil producing countries and the oil companies say that they can fight climate change without necessarily moving away from the utilization of fossil fuels. Now, in terms of uh, natural gas reserves, okay, the Arabian Gulf is home to the largest natural gas reserves in the world. Now you can see the figures on the right. Uh, Iran has about 974 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and it's the world's second largest gas reserves in the world uh, after Russia. Uh, Qatar has uh, 910 trillion cubic feet, and it's the world's third largest natural gas reserves, but the world's number one liquefied natural gas producer. And uh, liquefied natural gas is basically when you super cool natural gas until you reach it, until it reaches about the size of a basketball or so. And then when it's super cooled, you can ship it anywhere in the world uh, by tanker. Uh, prior to that, natural gas tended to be uh, fixed in one area, and you can only ship it by pipeline. But this frees up natural gas from being limited to certain areas, and you can ship it anywhere in the world. So this definitely increases its, its, its importance and its utilization uh, worldwide. Uh, Saudi Arabia has 239 trillion cubic feet, which is the world's fourth largest natural gas reserves. And the UAE has 214 trillion cubic feet and is the world's fifth largest natural gas reserves. But even though they have all these gas reserves, except for Qatar, there has been uh, inefficient utilization. Okay, so currently they have these reserves, but they're not utilizing it. And I'll explain why uh, subsequently. There is an energy crisis right now in the Gulf. Okay, when I was in Kuwait, there were substantial blackouts in <laughs> Kuwait, and there are blackouts all over the Gulf. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds counterintuitive, it's absolutely amazing, but they're not able to keep up with their power production there. Uh, the GCC is going to need to add 60 gigawatts of additional power between 2009 and 2015. And this represents about 80% of current capacity. And you can see here uh, to the right, about uh, 2007, the demand for power started to reach uh, the installed capacity. And then th that's when we start to have some major blackouts in the Gulf and brownouts. Then around 2008, we see there's a slight drop in demand. And that was due to perhaps a financial crisis. And a lot of people, there was a panic, of course. And people were monitoring how much energy they were using and so on. Uh, and then 2009, 2010, we see where demand will start to steadily outstrip the available supply, which means that blackouts are going to be enormous across the Gulf just absolutely enormous, and it's going to put a dent in their industrialization plans. Now, outside of the Dolphin Project, I'm going to speak about that later. It's a natural gas pipeline from uh, Qatar to the UAE and Oman. Uh, Intra-GCC gas trade is, is basically non-existent, okay? Qatar ships more gas to Asia than it does to Kuwait, and that is absolutely a shame. I mean, there's no intra-GCC gas trade. Now, demand growth in the Gulf has, has been a fairly robust 8 to 9% per year, and demand growth for power. It's the fastest rate of growth in the year, due to the reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, the GCC members have pledged up to about $100 billion 
in investment in the power generation sector over the next several years. So I will see if that's actually going to occur, but they have recognized that there's a problem that they need to deal with. Now, actually, that doesn't really look too good, but that illustrates what I'm talking about. Okay, this is a blackout. <laughs> and that's the reason why you don't see anything, because it's black. And that is what happens uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, in many areas in the Gulf. And it happens all the time. So many private buildings now have uh, private generators uh, that they have to use on a, almost a permanent basis due to these blackouts. Um, Kuwait has experienced crippling blackouts. Saudi Arabia has announced a moratorium on all new gas fired plants. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that new demand, power demand, is going, to be, uh, is going to be met by oil or heavy fuel, which is an extremely inefficient way to generate power. I mean, if you generate power by oil or, or heavy fuel, it, it simply does not make sense in that context. It makes more sense for them to export it. They simply do not have enough gas to uh, meet their uh, domestic demand. Uh, Oman has restricted its liquefied natural gas exports and redirected it to the local market. Uh, because it can't meet its local demand. And the UAE faces a major gas deficit of approximately 1 billion cubic feet per day in 2007. And this has also been in 2008 and now. And the Northern Emirates ha also have uh, major electricity and, uh, and water desalination shortages uh, as a result. Uh, in the UAE in the north right now, there has been a blackout, at least when I left, that was ongoing in the north. And it just caused substantial hardships because uh, for the few who have been to the Gulf, during the summertime, it is just horrendous, right? it, just the heat. So the reason why uh, generally during the summer you start to see the power blackouts is this is the, peri the period of peak demand because everyone has the air conditioners on, uh, no one wants to go outside, so you start to see the power usage spike during the summer. So that is in contrast to the West where generally the power spikes during the winter due to heating and so on. Now, I'll talk about the drivers of gas demand. Uh, the sustained oil price boom uh, in the Gulf, basically from 2001 into 2008, redirected an enormous amount of money from the industrialized countries to the Gulf. And some figures state about three trillion, four trillion dollars that have been just within that period have been redirected from the West to the Gulf due to the rise in oil price. Now, this increase in oil revenue also led to a corresponding increase in economic expansion in the Gulf. So during this period, the Gulf instituted major industrial projects uh, in uh, steel smelting and aluminum um, construction and so on in order to take advantage of their funds and not spend it in uh, ways which aren't necessarily um, beneficial for the local population. And, and I should contrast that because in 1973, uh, the oil embargo, which was uh, the first price revolution, that's what they called, uh, there was the Gulf countries and generally the governments did not have the understanding of how to effectively utilize just the enormous sums of money that came into their countries. So you would see money frittered away on uh, white elephant projects, basically prestige projects and so on, um, just planes. I mean, just the money there was enormous. Uh, people would, uh, when their car ran, ran out of gas, they would just like put it by the side of the street because, I mean, just they had so much money. Um, the official, which is true, which is true, there's actually an area, there's actually an area where you could drop off your car when you're done with it and just leave the keys there and anyone could just pick it up. That's a true story. Uh, the official government focus on economic diversification by industrialization, uh, that combined with the rapid increases in population uh, due to real estate development and, uh, and also the demographic uh, pressure has put increased upward pressure on gas demand. Now, the increase in oil prices from the period that I mentioned uh, before, uh, starting in 2001, uh, this due to the linkage. Now, when I talk about linkage, uh, the gas price is formed by a linkage with oil prices. So when the oil price goes up, generally the natural gas price goes up as well because it's linked. So this linkage with the oil price and the region-wide gas shortage, it put enormous pressure on the gas prices and caused a shortage. And the shortage caused the gas bubble. Okay, and the countries simply were not able to meet the uh, regional demand. Now, the GCC gas demand is uh, set to grow at about a robust 6.6% uh, uh, per annum, okay, which is quite significant. And this is nearly tr twice the rate for oil demand, which is 2.9%. Uh, it's the fastest rate of growth in the world as well. Uh, yes? Real quick question. When you say that they are linked, do you mean they are linked because they are both extracted at the same time, so they are physically linked, or do you mean that there is an equation that is used to determine prices, which includes both variables? Good, good question. Actually, both. Um, 
but by linked, what I meant was that uh, there is actually a uh, formula that links the gas price with oil price. However, most of the gas in the Gulf is produced alongside of oil. So because of that, uh, they're linked as well in the extraction. But there are also unassociated fields where the gas actually sits by itself. Yes. Now, I'd like to talk about the whys, okay, why there is this energy crisis. Okay, uh, there is little prospect for additional supply, uh, gas supply to come online soon in the Gulf. Uh, the reason why that is is because some of the biggest suppliers in the Gulf that are not experiencing uh, gas crisis are not going to sell their gas. Uh, Qatar, who has the largest gas reserves after Iran in the Gulf, uh, they basically put a moratorium on additional supplies until 2014 uh, because they thought that they have extracted too rapidly and they may have uh, damaged uh, their gas, gas reservoirs. Uh, the UAE gas as well is quite uh, sour and tight. And when I say sour, that means that it has an abundance of sulfur, so it makes it, um, to refine it requires uh, a lot of time and effort and also money as well. So it makes the price almost prohibitive. Uh, and when you add that to the price that they sell it at domestically, it makes it, um, uh, it's not attractive at all. Now, Iraq has a potential supplier. Iraq has gas, but uh, for obvious reasons, it's not necessarily uh, number one on the list uh, for being a stable supplier of natural gas regionally for security concerns. Now, Iran is facing many multifaceted problems, uh, which is inhibiting uh, the development of its natural gas sector. We see that uh, the sanctions regime, um, which has been imposed after the revolution, is, uh, is uh, turning off potential investors, even though there are some, the majority of potential investors do not even want to deal with Iran. They consider it much too unstable. The election, the recent election-related violence also has, has turned off potential investors. They don't even want to deal with Iran. Uh, Iran, as well, is facing its own problem in supplying the domestic market. Uh, there is too much demand and too little supply, even though it has the second largest gas reserves in the world. And uh, even Iran had two major supply disruptions over the past several years. And, um, because Iran has to import gas from Turkmenistan, uh, when Turkmenistan shut off its gas exports, uh, I guess during a mini Russia, mini Russia Ukraine dispute, to Iran, uh, what happened, uh, individuals that lived in the north of the country uh, actually froze to death. And this is a country with the second largest natural gas reserves in the world, but there's no utilization. So you can see the contradictions that are inherent uh, in the energy sector for many of the Gulf countries. And there are also pricing disputes with potential customers. Now, that's a bit esoteric, but uh, what I mean by that is that Iran sells its gas domestically at a very low price. So what it seeks to do is cross-subsidize its domestic supply by selling gas at extremely high prices externally. So I, I hope that makes sense. So as a result, Iran wants to sell its gas to any potential customers regionally for extremely high prices, but these countries such as the UAE and Bahrain and Kuwait do not want to pay that extremely high price. So there are uh, quite significant pricing disputes between the two parties. So that's another reason why Iran is not able to offload its gas on the international market, even though the demand is there. Now the crux of the gas shortage, uh, in the Gulf there is a concept known as administrative pricing. And administrative pricing basically means that there is, the gas prices are not determined according to market uh, market forces, okay? It's basically set as a governmental price, okay? Uh, so because of that, it has no relation at all to the available supply and demand, because if it did, the gas price would actually increase when demand increased as well. The average cost for gas development in the Gulf hovers around $4 per mm BTU. We can see here at the local prices that uh, it rarely, I mean, that it rarely breaks out of a dollar and 20 cents uh, per million British thermal units, which is which is the uh, measurement uh, for natural gas. Uh, now, there has been some market evolution. Uh, there have been some short-term bridge contracts that have reached about $5 per MMBTU, but uh, so far that hasn't been uh, consistent. <coughs> now, some of the strategies that the Gulf countries have used to cope, uh, they are trying to pursue renewable energy, uh, solar power. Uh, there has been uh, talk about uh, utilizing hydropower, wind power, and so on nuclear energy. I'm certain everyone here has heard about the nuclear power plants that the UAE wants to build in Abu Dhabi. And the reason why it wants to do that is due to uh, this power crisis I've been telling you about. And also, a major factor behind the Iranian nuclear, uh, 
how can I say, the nuclear dispute is due to the fact that it's having this power crisis and that it wants to supply energy to its domestic population. Now, there might, now definitely there are other issues as well, but that's also a major issue. I mean, these countries are turning towards nuclear energy. Now, there are conservation campaigns. In the UAE, for instance, they have the UAE Heroes Campaign in order to educate the populace about effective energy use. And currently, there is not really an understanding that you have to turn off your lights and air conditioning when you leave the home and that, you know, so on. So they're trying to educate the populace about that. Uh, coal, uh, Dubai is planning four new coal-fired plants. There are also natural gas imports uh, via the Dolphin Project and what is known as the GCC Interconnection Project, which is a project attempting to link all the major electrical sectors of the various GCC countries. Now, I, actually, I'm going to speed up a bit because I want to allow time for questions as well. But uh, this is the Dolphin Project right here, and this is the first natural gas uh, export project intra Gulf, and it basically exports gas here from the North Field, which is the largest uh, natural gas field in the world, and it exports it to the UAE where it lands at Atuila. Then it goes to Jabal Ali right here, which is a major industrial area uh, in the UAE, and then it goes onward, or downward actually, to Al Ain and then to Oman. Uh, so this has been quite revolutionary in the Gulf because there has not been any type of natural gas trade previous to that. And um, it basically exports about 2 billion, uh, cubic, uh, billion cubic feet per day out of a total capacity of 3.2 billion cubic feet per day. Now this took off much of the demand pressure, but uh, much more energy is needed. Now this is a quick look at the, the, the G GCC interconnection project linking the energy sectors. Now, what I'm going to do is actually finish quite quickly because I want to answer some questions. But uh, what's happening now due to the financial crisis is there has been a turn towards utilizing Islamic finance and regional banks in order to uh, redirect development uh, intra Gulf so that uh, Gulf energy products are no longer looking outside. Uh, for Western banks in order to develop their energy, and they're looking more inward. Uh, and we can see here the issuance of uh, Sukuk, which are Islamic debt instruments, has increased exponentially in the Gulf. And uh, basically, I'm going to end right here, and I'd like to open the floor for questions.